So I think we'll uh, start the webinar. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me, everybody? Dan, can you raise your hand if you can hear me? Yeah, good, good. So good evening, everybody. Welcome to Harrogate Harlow's first webinar. Um, so this evening, we're going to be talking everything greater trochanteric pain syndrome. Um, thanks all for joining. Um, so this is going to be a sort of a, I'm going to host the evening. Any questions that you want to post, if you just pop them in the Q&A, and I will then put them to the panel once they've all done their presentations. Uh, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end of the evening. So to start the evening, we're going to start off with Gareth Stevens, who's a clinical research physio, physio at the Royal Orthopaedic in Birmingham. And he's heavily involved in the research around uh, the physiotherapy management of greater trochanteric pain syndrome and some of the research studies that have been uh, taking place in that. Then we're going to follow up with um, Dan Fasher, who's a consultant radi radiologist at Harrogate District and Yorkshire Radiology. And Dan's going to give us his expert opinion on the radiological approach to lateral hip pain. And then last but not least, uh, Mr. John Conroy, who I've worked with for many years, consultant orthopedic surgeon um, in Harrogate. Um, he's going to talk about the surgical challenges of uh, lateral hip pain and peritrochanteric and the probably and the peritrochanteric space just learn to speak. Um, and then at the end, then we'll have a, a Q&A. So get your questions coming through through the question and answer section. And we'll try and answer as many of the questions as you can. We'll try and make it as interactive as possible. Um, I do apologize for hosting it on the what appears to be the best night of the year. Um, when I did organize this back in January, it was, uh, I didn't think that tonight was going to be such a, a great, uh, great weather. Um, if we can interact on Twitter, that's all everybody's Twitter hang handles. So we've got Yorkshire Radiology, there's Gareth's there and John's and then Harrogate Harlow. So any feedback you can put on there um, would be greatly appreciated. And uh, yeah, so Gareth, would you like to um, take us away? Over to you, Gareth. Okay. So, um, hello everyone. Um, my name's Gareth Stevens. I'm a uh, I'm a clinical research physiotherapist based at the Royal Orthopaedic Hospital in Birmingham. Um, I work three days a week as a clinician, um, where I'm seeing mostly patients with persistent lower limb tendinopathy, and I work two days a week um, in research, where I've been building up a, a portfolio of research recently with um, Dr. Seth O'Neill into greater trochanteric pain syndrome um, and the aim of my presentation today will just be to discuss um, what some of that research has brought out in terms of the uh, characteristics of patients that we see um, so what the evidence says about clinical diagnosis and the um, more common than Achilles tendinopathy it's a disabling condition so for those of you that don't know the um, EQ5D score scale gives you a, a, a score from zero to one where zero is somebody who's in the worst possible health and one would be that you're in the best possible health. So the average patient presenting to an NHS physiotherapist with, with a primary complaint of a GCPS has an EQ5D score of 0.6. So the average uh, person in the UK between 55 and 75 would, have a, would normally have an EQ5D score of about 0.8. So that, that 0.2 shift in the uh, is shows that compared to the people without GTPS or the population norm, this is a, a population that's quite disabled. And part of the reason why they're so disabled is something quite unique to the condition, I think, certainly compared to other low limb tendinopathies, is that so many patients have pain during rest, so they have problems with uh, pain when they lie or sleep, as well as during activity, which significantly affects their quality of life. It's a persistent condition, so at a presentation to a, uh, a physiotherapist in the UK, um, more than half of patients will already have had their symptoms for a year. And 40% of them will have already had an episode of treatment that hasn't been successful. So all of those factors alone are um, pro uh, prognostic um, factors for poor outcomes. So this is quite a big problem that we're dealing with in terms of um, an NHS perspective. A little bit of background to the condition. Um, I'm sure this will, be, this will be covered in much more detail by the other two speakers, but um, it was traditionally thought of um, as uh, trochanteric bursas, bursitis, so an inflammatory condition here of the trochanteric bursa. Um, 
however, more commonly, um, surgical and histological studies have suggested that we more commonly see um, uh, tendinopathic changes in the gluteus medius, or this is dissected gluteus minimus tendon. So they're the, the, the two areas where we most more commonly see pathology. Isolated bursal pathology is rare. Um, data suggests somewhere between 10 and 20% of patients might have just purely isolated pathology. And most commonly, um, patients will have a mishmash of, of, of these symptoms, including changes within the ITB itself. So that leads on to what do we call it? Well, that, that depends a little bit on where you are, um, because in the UK, and if you read UK research, we tend to call it uh, greater trochanteric pain syndrome. And that's mostly to reflect the fact that these, you see these multitude of changes and that the anatomy around the, the lateral hip is complex. And also because, as with most of these things, um, if you um, take a, uh, an age match population who have no pain whatsoever, they'll also have similar findings on their imaging. And so to reflect this ambiguity, we tend to call it uh, greater trochanteric pain syndrome. However, in Australia, they'll tend to call it gluteal tendinopathy. Uh, the reasons for that being that it's the most common um, thing seen on scans because inflammation tends to play a minimal role in the condition. And because they think that it has a, a more positive impact for patients if you can give them a specific diagnosis. And also you'll think they feel is you're much more likely to attract research funding uh, and have your funding have an impact when you're talking about a specific condition. So depending on where you are, it gets a different name, but pretty much broadly, more often than not, we're talking about the same, the same thing when you read the literature. So who gets it? Um, firstly, patients who get, um, uh, there's a generic risk factors for any tendinopathy or more prone to get it. So those who do very little amounts of activity or, or, and those that do um, excessive amounts of activity are more likely to get it from a load perspective as well as those that have had a sudden change in their, uh, their load, um, they are more likely to develop the condition. And then there's uh, systemic factors such as diabetes, um, high levels of central adiposity, um, patients that take statins, uh, patients that take antibiotics known as fluoroquinolones, which are known to, be, um, to uh, um, have side effects of uh, being toxic for tendons. And the big one that I haven't put here is the, um, any, of course, any inflammatory arthropathy who are very likely to uh, um, develop these insertional tendinopathies. In terms of the risk factors specifically for GTPS, um, you're more likely to get it if you're a female, it's a four to one ratio. If you're um, over 50 years old, if you've had an early or complicated menopause, and if you have increased BMI, And one of the, uh, the group of other risk factors uh, firstly relates to this first of all, Cox of Aero. So people that are um, born with a shallow angle between the, the shaft of the femur and the neck of the femur. So if you have a shallower angle here, um, you're more uh, likely to get the, the, the condition. Um, and it's equally, if you have increased pelvic girth and if you've had a total hip replacement, you're more likely to develop the condition. And we know from Kim Allison's work that if we take a group of patients with hip osteoarthritis and compare them to a, um, a group with um, greater trochanteric pain syndrome, they tend to have weaker hip abductors and walk with a greater hip adduction angle. And the reason why we think all of these factors might be significant is because it, it were in around the greater trochanter. So here you can see with Cox of Vera, this is um, a study that looked at um, um, cadavers, but it looks at what it might, the force is going through the lateral hip in a weight bearing um, position or a simulated weight bearing position. And they found that if you had uh, coxavera, there was about a thousand newtons of force going through the outside of the hip. The compression caused by the fact that the ITB becomes taut up if you, in this position um, versus normals who had a uh, kind of 655 newtons of force going through the, the, the outside of the uh, greater trochanter. And the reason why that might be significant is because we know that compressive load seems to be a risk factor for developing tendinopathy. So most common tendinopathies we see occur at the site where tendons are compressed against a bone. So here you see an example of the insertion of Achilles tendinopathy, where in dorsiflex positions, the Achilles tendon compresses against the calcaneus um, and where we see most commonly insertion of tendinopathies. The seminal paper on that is this paper here by Jill Cook and Chris Purdom, if you're interested. And uh, Tom Goom does a really nice summary of this website and produces a nice table here of 
um, common tendinopathies where they compressed and positions in which they're compressed, which can guide your your clinical management, and that'll become more clear as we um, as we move through the interventions and treatment. However, having said all of that, in terms of um, understanding why one person develops tendon pain versus another, it's still open to speculation. Um, current trends in the research are that the role of inflammation is is, is coming back again. Um, we don't think it's full prostaglandin-driven inflammation, but it definitely seems to play a role. And a lot of that research is being driven in Glasgow at the moment. Um, it's been particularly in lateral hip pain. We know that there are changes in the central nervous system that seem to occur that don't protect, don't seem to occur in patients that have things like Achilles tendinopathy. Um, and there's other research groups looking at things like the changes in, in mechanical properties of the tendon. So whether the tendon becomes more elastic or or maybe um, uh, more compliant with pathology. The, the bottom line is we're still no clearer to understanding why one person develops pain and the other one doesn't. So how do these patients present? Well, primarily they present with pain over the greatest cancer, as you might expect, um, with a referral down into the lateral thigh. But interestingly, um, they commonly also present with low back pain. So one in five potentially presents with, with associated low back pain. Um, they also present with buttock and hip pain, groin pain, um, knee pain, and then less commonly pain that refers below the knee. What do they tell us? Well, they tell us almost in common numbers that, that, that walking is their biggest problem, um, as well as lying and sleeping, uh, as we talked about earlier. Um, standing, sitting and driving, and going up and down the stairs are the, the problems they commonly report. And... Um, in the NHS, we, we know that these patients also commonly already have other sites of musculoskeletal pain. So almost 50% of them have an, another site of musculoskeletal pain, which is, again, nods to the fact that these patients um, tend to be com complex in terms of how they present. So in terms of a clinical diagnosis, how would we go about making the diagnosis? So the research tells us that the best test we've got in terms of specificity and sensitivity is just good old fashioned palpation of the greatest trochanter in sideline. However, if we're looking for the best um, battery of tests we've got, it would be a positive palpation test plus any one of these three tests. So these three tests, first of all, you have the faders resistance test. This uh, test is where we take patients into the end of range faders position, and then we get asked, then we resist internal rotation in that position. So we resist internal rotation because um, once the, the hip goes above 90 degrees of flexion, um, the gluteus medius and minimus muscles become internal rotators. We've got the single leg stance test, which is where the patient stands on the painful leg with one fingertips against the wall. They hold it for, for 30 seconds and we see if it reproduces their symptoms. And then we have this adduction resistance test, which is where we take patients into the end of range OBAS position, and then we resist hip abduction in that, that position. So if you get a positive palpation with any one of these three, then um, the specificity and sensitivity would suggest that we're, we're talking about a patient who's um, got a primary complaint of uh, GTPS. So what does the data tell us about the um, physio management of the condition. Well, um, unusually in uh, for physiotherapy, in GTPS, we've got two quite big, um, really well conducted randomised control trials of patients, both suggesting that physiotherapy is the the gold standard of management for the condition. So that's quite unusual, and also something that uh, we should be we should be pleased about, really. Um, the LEAP trial, which was the slightly was the bigger of the two, it was a three-arm trial. So that compared an exercise and education intervention to uh, injection, a single uh, corticosteroid injection, and a wait and see approach. And the GLOBE study um, compared an education and exercise approach to a sham exercise approach. Um, both studies importantly recruited patients from community dwellers they weren't necessarily um, patients who were um, uh, asking receiving care for their treatment or, or on a waiting list for care both studies were done in australia which is um, also uh, commonly how australian research studies um, recruit patients the only the main difference in the recruitment target population was that the globe study only looked at uh, females who were one year postmenopausal whereas the LEAP trial included men and women. 
So what do the two studies have in common? Firstly, there you go, is that the education component of both studies was very similar. And it advised patients about how to reduce the amount of compression going through the lateral hip. So patients were advised not to stand in this hip sway position and not to stand cross-legged and were advised to stand with their weight equally shared over their feet with their, their feet hip width apart as much as possible to avoid sitting cross-legged or with narrow knees. And for women, the things that had to, had to wear skirts for work and things like that, they were encouraged to wear trousers and to keep their knees kind of hip width apart. If patients routinely had been given or were doing stretches that, were, that are commonly prescribed, such as these piriformis cross-leg stretches or ITB stretches, they were told to stop those, those exercises. And uh, if patients lay on this side, um, again, with the hip dropping into to adduction, then patients were either encouraged to lie on their back with a pillow under their knees or to lie on this side with a pillow between their knees. So both studies incorporated this, this um, education component to their interventions. The actual exercise intervention that was delivered as part of the LEAP study um, was a, uh, 14 sessions of supervised exercise done over eight weeks. Um, patients did their exercises once daily on top of that. And they used a Borg scale to ensure that patients were working at quite a high intensity with their exercises. Now, the, the main principle of the exercises used in the, the LEAPS trial were to stimulate the deep gluteal muscles and to minimize the um, amount of um, activity in the ITB to try and stop the ITB over contracting and compressing the gluteal tendons. And, and the research group from Australia that did this are quite sensitive about this. Therefore, the, the exercise they prescribed were mostly closed chain. Um, and so just talk you through, oh, talk you through the exercises here a moment um, to give you an example of the sort of exercises that they used. Um, you can see that all patients were given isometric abduction exercises. They were given bridging that was progressed from double leg to split bridge to a single leg hover to single leg extension and then um, onto single leg dips. They were given this functional retraining program where they started off with a double leg squat. They were progressed to offset squat and then single leg stand and then into single leg squats. And patients were only able to progress if they were able to maintain their pelvic alignment and not drop into uh, adduction when they, they did these, these movements. And they finished off again with this single leg step up. Um, patients were giving some abductor uh, load exercises, which were sidestepping and they were progressed on to uh, doing side slides. And then they did some heavier loading using a Pilates reformer, which started in standing and was built onto squat of the uh, abductor loading. And then they were then progressed onto these scooter squats again, where they had to maintain their pelvic alignment during the, um, during the, the intervention. So what were the results of the, the, the LEAP trial? Well, the LEAP trial showed that 80% of patients that, that finished the, the start of the trial were either moderately uh, much or very much better. And that from the primary outcome measure, which was this um, global rating of change scale, um, that education and exercise was superior to both corticosteroid injection and wait and see approaches. One of the interesting things that came out of the study was although patients reported that they were feeling better than they did a year ago, their pain scores were quite um, were quite different at 12 months. So in terms of there was no statistical pain difference between corticosteroid injection and the intervention at 12 months. However, at eight weeks, there was a significant difference, but perhaps not where we would think it was because actually the exercise and education intervention provided greater pain relief for eight weeks than the steroid injection, which isn't classically what we see in, in other studies. So that was a point of interest that the researchers are, are taking on, which I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. So this is the other study, the GLOBE study. The GLOBE intervention was a bit more of a pragmatic intervention, so less sort of physio intensive. Um, these, they also did 10 to 15 minute home exercise program, which in this trial they had to do twice daily rather than the once daily, but patients only attended four sessions over eight weeks, over 12 weeks rather, this was a 12 week intervention. Um, and in this study, the patient's exercises were progressed from hip hitching to hip hitch with a toe tap, hip hitch with a hip swing, and then onto single leg squat. I should say from that, that they were less concerned about the, the compression uh, element in this, in this um, study. And they went for exercises that, that primarily they felt loaded the gluteal muscles. 
Um, so help, hence the, the hip hitching. Um, they were um, progressed. So they did um, wall squats onto sit to stands, split sit to stands, and progressed onto a step up. And then they would do, they started at double leg calf raising. They did calf raising with a toe tap and then onto single leg calf raising. So that was a broad outline of the four stages of the globe intervention. And that was compared interestingly to sham exercise. So this, with this group, they were given a, a whole group of, um, of exercises. Um, uh, they're, getting, they're getting exercises. Um, so they were getting um, uh, a, a similar intensity of exercises. Um, so they were dosed exactly the same. They had to do them the same amount, but the uh, exercises were not specifically targeted at the lateral hip. There was um, inner range quads. They were given sitting calf raises. You can see lateral flexions. They were given some hip lateral rotations in the chair. So they were given different, the same dosed exercise, but not particularly targeted at the gluteal muscles. And the outcome of this intervention, interestingly, was that both groups um, had a very similar um, outcome in terms of how they responded. So they responded um, in terms of this, they found that, that the intervention group um, and the sham group responded both about 50 to 54, 56% of them um, were improved at 12 months in terms of how, you know, how successful this intervention was. Um, so on face of it, first of all, it looks different to the LEAP study because we found 80% of patients in the LEAP study were, were um, hit the success point. But the threshold for success in the GLOBE study was actually uh, higher. So the GLOBE study called a success. People who said they were either much better or very much better, whereas LEAP included people who were moderately better, much better, and very much better. So the um so in terms of the the, the intervention that there's no potentially that the, that's a little bit misleading in terms of the when you compare the success rates um so with this this study really does raise some questions about how we prescribe exercise and how exercise has its effect so from the similarities between the two studies what can we recommend physios do well, primarily, the thing that comes out is activity modification. Um, so teaching patients postures that reduce the level of hip adduction. And then uh, a graded loading approach of progressed exercises that are built with increasing intensity. And also that we ensure patients are working at a, a reasonably hard level when they do their exercises. They're certainly the two common themes that come out from the research and how the data would inform clinical practice. Equally, that, that I would suggest that 12 weeks is a sufficient amount of time over which we should be um, loading patients with their exercises. Um, or as Greg Lehman would call it, um, calming things down and then building them back up again. Um, and that seems to be what the data is suggesting we do uh, is most effective with these patients. However, these two studies do raise some really interesting questions. As physios, we have to be really open minded to this at the moment, I think, in terms of how does exercise work? and does it need to do we need to be specific or non-specific with our exercises certainly in terms of pain the data suggests that that, that it's uh, pretty speculative at the moment in terms of whether we really do need to be specific um but we have to you know keep keep looking at this through um, better quality research studies um we've got uh, the biggest improvements um seen in the in the uh, were well, the biggest improvements in these research studies seen due to the activity modification so the fact that actually patients in the LEAP study did so well at eight weeks, so their pain control was so good, might lend itself to the fact that actually it's the activity modification that was the key bit in both of these, these studies. Um, and so therefore, the Australian group are now looking at a study where they're just going to deliver the activity modification and see how patients go. So we'll be very interested to see what, what the results of that show. Um, we have to say that the, the GLOBE intervention was deliverable within the NHS, whereas the LEAP study certainly wouldn't be deliverable at the moment. Um, and then we have to have the, the interventions been more successful than wait and see. So although the strap line is that both interventions have been really successful, um, when we look at the actual changes in the, in the visa G, which is the disease specific outcome measure, we can see that although there is a slight tendency for the physio interventions to be better, it's neither clinically nor statistically significant. Um, and so one of the, that might be because the visa G is not a particularly sensitive outcome measure, but it could also be because when you're asking people how much better they are now than they were a year ago, 
that there's certainly some potentially bias or, or, or problems with recall asking people how, how, how much better they were a year ago. So again, more questions about, about those studies and how we implement them in clinical practice. And finally, on that note, if you compare the patients that went into the LEAP study to patients that we see in the NHS that report to us as NHS physios, um, the patients we see in the NHS tend to be older, heavier, in more pain, and with worse quality of life than the patients who entered these trials. And so therefore, they've already got indi uh, prognostic indicators of poor outcome that we have to be mindful of. Just as a quick aside, in terms of uh, common adjuncts to physiotherapy, the data suggests that at the moment steroid injection um, will give short-term pain relief, but not a lot in the long term. Um, I think we you know we have to be a bit judicious about how often we we inject patients. Um, some of the data points towards that, and the one to watch I think is probably Shockwave. Again, there's some interesting camps developed in this in this world. The Australians have completely dismissed it and said it's no better than a placebo. There's a group at UCL in London, uh, led by Dylan Morrissey, who are who think there might be something in it as an adjunct to treatment and are certainly um, uh, doing more research in this field. And they're saying their preliminary data at the moment looks quite good. So again, that's another space to watch in terms of published uh, data in the future. So to conclude, um, GTPS is a debilitating and persistent condition. Um, the current data supports that we use activity modification to reduce the uh, hip adduction and we use a graded exercise approach which is progressed and kept at a sufficient intensity. However, which exercises we prescribe is still very much open to, to speculation. Um, and we have to bear in mind when interpreting this the research from Australia into the UK NHS that um, the patients we see are inherently more complex and therefore we're hoping in the future to have some more um, uh, trials in the UK NHS population that will really be able to give us a clear steer on, on how we manage these patients. Uh, thanks very much for listening. hope that was in some way interesting and I'd be yeah, happy to answer any questions. So thanks for that, Gareth. Um, we've got a couple of questions on here. The first one um, is about the use of shockwave, actually, which I think was um, put on there just before you touched on that bit on your slide. Um, and then we've got another one here saying, would you recommend patients who present with GTPS are physically seen by physio or could be managed by online physio service that, any, that, that any, many GPs are sending to first? Um, so online physio service be to be um, um, just to clarify, would that be to be managed virtually? Do you think so in terms of so seeing yeah, physio? I think yeah. so. I mean, I think I think the, the 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 physio who's posted this. Obviously, with COVID, we've seen a big increase in the number of um, uh, virtual consultations that are being done. Um, I know certainly in Harrogate, we are seeing people virtually and and also on on the phone. Do you think that it would be appropriate for a patient to be managed in that way? Or do you think they, they need to be seen face to face? Yeah, I think phone would be difficult with this, this client group. Um, but I think there is a potential to manage them with, with virtual consultations. Um, certainly because of the, the, a lot of the ones that we see is the data suggesting are quite um, are highly disabled. And so a lot of the functional tests that you can do reasonably well over um over virtual the diagnosis is not particularly complicated um uh, so for for a, for a definite portion of it, i think they can be managed over over virtual managed virtually um you know looking at the, and testing their exercises um you know on an intimate basis you will always see the more disabled group that are highly sensitized and that's something we have to be mindful of that some of these patients are very very sensitive to and those ones that have those uh, real extreme pain um, pain presentations. I would say they're a much bigger challenge, and I would be happier seeing those face to face. Yeah, I mean, I, I know I know myself as well, Gareth, working in FCP service. Certain patients you can manage on the phone or online, can't you? Depending on yeah. the the d degree of their pathology and the degree of their disability. But I think, I mean, I, I, in my own personal opinion, with these patients, I think you need to get that accurate that diagnosis accurate first and get a buy-in from the patient and then you can potentially in my experience manage them virtually going on from there would you agree with that yeah yeah Depending I think so. on what yeah, stage I think they're I, at. yeah 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that's um, that's something I would I would um, I would agree with in principle. I think, um, as I say, like with most of these things, I think there's a, there's probably a middle ground. It's like, it's like a bell curve, isn't it? And the middle, yeah. the middle kind of sixty percent, you could manage quite nicely virtually. And it's that those top ends, I would say, that that, that are difficult from a physio perspective to manage. Absolutely, and that's that's patient centred care, isn't it? It's it's picking and choosing your patients and deciding what is the best intervention for them, and uh, and going from there, really. Yeah. Um, so we've got no more questions for you, Gareth. Um, that's Dan great. Thank you have. very much so far. I'm sure some will arise as we go along. So just a, yeah, I've got a, questions. <laughs> oh, you've got questions, Dan. Yeah. Well, then, Dan, give us some questions. So you know, with re- with regards managing virtually, I think one of the problems with that is that we've gone virtual kind of in anger because we had to. And I just don't think that we've seen the full evolution of the virtual physio platforms yet, because I like, I'd love to hear if anyone else knows different, but all I've really seen is physios essentially doing one-to-one meetings with their patients and desperately trying to kind of show them exercises and, and, just think there's so much further we can go that is not app based, but involves a consult, um, but is not just you know a meeting. Mm. Yes, I agree. It would be interesting to see. I mean, I think COVID's pushed us much further down that line, hasn't it? And I think, I mean, to think that this time last year, I, I wouldn't have even contemplated doing a, a webinar. Um, and here we are now. It's um, I think there's. I mean, which of... virtual physio platforms do you guys use? And, and people in the chat, I'd like to know as well. Yeah, could, so could people on the chat give us some insight um, as to which? Um, yeah, so I mean, as Sue's saying from Harrogate, we use um, Attend Anywhere because I think the license at Harrogate and the NA, we've got a license for the year through Attend Anywhere. Right, so we, we, we can come back to that point as well um as we go along if that's all right so we're going to move on to you dan yeah i'll You're start up. teeing up i think john had a question for you whilst i start um teeing ah. up my share actually so what's your question john I, I was just going to um say i thought lucy's point was um a really good one because it looked in those studies that some of the patients who present later are the most difficult ones to treat and it, if we can catch these patients early on, more um, modification, as soon as they get even the inkling of symptoms in that particular group, I think you might get much better results. It's like education isn't it, of, of the patients of how to avoid it when it's really early on, rather than them getting really significant pain and become a more complex problem. We've also got to realize that it's really hard to diagnose exactly what's causing it as well. So um, I think there is a role for educating people with activity modifications really early. I don't, I don't know what Gareth thinks about that. Uh, yeah, in an ideal world, it would be, it would be, it would be great um, for us to be able to intervene with patients uh, earlier in their pathology. Um, it just suggests that with the condition that um, we don't tend to see it uh, present, people don't present with it very early on. And um, some of the qualitative work we've done has suggested that, that, that patients actually, it's a condition patients tend to sort of live with and get on with for quite a long period of time, partly because they've often got coexisting um, uh, musculoskeletal pain, other things going on. Um, uh, sometimes the time of life that it affects people, it tends to be a condition that people live with for longer. And so I think there is a general awareness issue out there that we, that, um, to try and say this is a, a serious condition and I totally agree we could see them earlier I think we could stop them progressing but there seems to be something about this population where they don't present as early as we'd like them to um, yeah it's certainly interesting things if we can capture them early from a research perspective it would be great so we've got a few more um, people saying that they use the QRX which is the system that links directly to system one so certainly if you're working in primary care um, a QRX is great because it interacts directly with system one and you can do your consultations through that. Yeah, it's a good piece of kit, but it, all of them, I think, are just meeting software, aren't they? And I, I think that there's, there's space for evolution here. I mean, I think, think, I think about there's a things like... for you there, Dan, to develop that, isn't there? 
Well, I might be onto it already. Maybe that's why I'm bringing this up. Maybe this is a bit of market research for me, actually. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, are you seeing my starting slide? Am I good to go? You are. You're good to go. Thanks, Dan. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name's Dan Fash. I'm a consultant musculoskeletal radiologist, and I'm going to talk about the radiological approach to lateral hip pain. You can see I haven't just limited it to greater trochanteric pain syndrome because I think that one of the roles of the radiologist is to really come in when things are confusing and um, work out what is, is actually um, going on for um, patients. So a little bit about me, first of all, I trained down in London at Imperial College, followed by a fellowship in Perth, Western Australia. And I've been a consultant in Harrogate, specializing in MSK since 2014. I also have a couple of other roles. I'm the regional clinical lead for the Yorkshire Imaging Collaborative, which is a network of hospitals working together. And I, I got the tap on the shoulder and the, the call to be a director of imaging at uh, NHS Nightingale about this time last year. So that was an interesting role to take on. Um, I have NHS and private practice in Harrogate. Um, private practice through Yorkshire Radiology, Harrogate Harlow and BMI the Duchy and NHS practice uh, uniquely at Harrogate District Hospital. So here's what I'm going to go through. Um, diagnostic imaging, um, a recommended algorithm for your imaging, how to request imaging and to ask if there's a role for interventional radiology. We heard a little bit about that already. And then I'm gonna put in um, an important thing, which I think is the swerve balls. And I think this is where radiology can help. Swerve balls are you know, the unexpected, the cause of lateral hip pain you weren't expecting. And we'll round off with my key take home points. So what exactly is trochanteric pain syndrome? Now, I'm not going to spend too long on this because we had an excellent uh, intro um, from Gareth on the, the background and pathophysiology, but a lot of conflicting terminology is often used. So when I read requests, I see a mixture of these terms. Trochanteric bursitis remains very common. Um, gluteal tendinopathy is, is thankfully also quite common, more from a musculoskeletal market. And... I don't really see this, but I do like to think of GTPS as the rotator cuff syndrome of the hip. Now, etiology-wise, MSK radiologists are fairly simplistic characters, and I think it's caused by two things, friction and impingement. So if we look at predisposing factors and bear that in mind, weight now, everybody always says obesity or high weight is a, um, a cause of GTPS. But I also see a, a number of very low BMI people who quite simply don't have enough padding on there. And when they lie on their side in bed, they cause impingement on the greater trochanter. And then greater trochanteric morphology is important. So curvy hips, I'm afraid ladies and some men, um, can be problematic. And dysplasia of the hip um, can leave you with um, a shape that you weren't meant to have, a femoral head neck angle, which predisposes you to this condition. And then um, we look at activities. So we know that it is quite common in activities that cause friction. So runners are the one we hear a lot about but also cyclists and other repetitive sports which cause the tendons to rub on the side of the trochanter there. Over on the other side, conditions which cause gait alteration, and they can come from anywhere, really from the spine down, so scoliosis and lower back pain, through with osteoarthritis, anywhere in the lower limb, hip, knee, ankle, and then muscle and tendon problems in any of these areas as well, which modify your gait. And then post-surgical changes. So surgery often ends up with a change in limb length. And also there is a phase of recovery of the tendons and muscles. So let's do a quick review of the radiological anatomy relevant to this part of the body. 
And I know we're talking about tendinopathy here, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the bursi around there because they're often quite confused and mixed up with each other. So around the greater trochanter, we can think of it as having three aspects to it, an anterior, a lateral, and a posterior. And the posterior has got some extra features to it, which we'll explore when we look at the facets. So we have an anterior facet, a lateral facet, and then on the posterior facet, we've got a posterior and a posterior superior. Now, why these areas are important? Because on the anterior facet attaches the gluteus minimus tendon, and a little bit of it spreads over onto the lateral facet where it conjoins with gluteus medius. Medius also inserts onto the posterior superior facet, and not too much goes on on the true posterior part. If I add not the little glute and medial side, minimus, subgluteus medius, a trochanteric, and a subgluteus maximus bursa, which isn't um, a cause of great excitement usually. So thinking about that anatomy, let's have a look what happens with friction. We have two distinct layers here. We've got a superficial layer between the um, iliotibial band and the first layer of medius and minimus muscles, and then a deep layer between those muscles and the bone of the trochanter itself. And those are two distinct layers between which friction can happen. And then impingement takes place when we have compressive forces, typically coming from the side of the hip when a patient lays on their side, squashing all of these structures together against the prominence of the greater trochanter. But bursitis is by far not the most common radiological finding. It's gluteal tendinopathy. And this condition is largely a tendinopathy rather than a bursitis. So now let's take a look at the role for diagnostic imaging of this condition. Starting off with plain film radiography or x-rays, a pelvic x-ray is most commonly used. And what we're looking for on it is first and foremost, never forget this, osteoarthritis. Because even though it can present like in so many different ways and as lateral hip pain, posterior groin pain, it's just so common that we should always have that at the top of our differential list. Then we're looking at the morphological features of the proximal femur and to a lesser extent, the acetabulum. We might be looking for enthesopathy and of course, other causes of hip pain. Let's start with a normal radiograph because in radiology, we need to understand features of normality. So in this example, both hip joint spaces are well-preserved. The femoral head contours are nice and round and normal, and there's no irregularity of the bones. And then if we slide down the femoral necks to the trochanters, we can see normal femoral head neck angles and normal morphology around the trochanters with no chunks taken off from prior trauma or surgery and no irregularity to suggest bony enthesopathy. So our old foe osteoarthritis, it's incredibly common and it can present with a very diverse pain profile. So it should always be kept in mind as a differential diagnosis even if we think we're pretty good at detecting it as musculoskeletal doctors. Examination findings are absolutely key with osteoarthritis, but don't forget there can definitely be coexistence of osteoarthritis seen here with stage two avascular necrosis bilaterally and with trochanteric pain syndrome, because when we have osteoarthritis, the gait is modified. We end up with the Trendelenburg gait and that puts extra stress on those tendons around the trochanters. And it leads to what we see here, which is a fluffy appearance around the bony contours, also known as enthesopathy. 
Anthesopathy may not be a term which you commonly hear. It represents pathology of the attachments of tendons, ligaments, or capsular structures onto underlying bones. And it can be of inflammation. Here's a zoomed in radiograph showing anthesopathy. And what we can see is that the greater trochanter's contours are no longer smooth. There are lots of little fuzzy bits, which look a little bit like osteophytes around it. That's the same patient's MRI scan. And you can see that the black cortex normally seen on an MRI scan has turned to a sort of fuzzy white line. And there is again, what you may well call an osteophyte on the inferior margin of the greater trochanter. And this paper back in 2010 demonstrated that these findings on plane radiographs are significant and they're correlated with greater trochanteric pain syndrome. Now, not quite enthesopathy, but something which makes me say, it definitely is a rotator cuff syndrome because you're more used to seeing calcific tendinopathy in the shoulder, but this is a case of calcific tendinopathy of the and it's a really big chunk and it's definitely going to be a cause of greater trochanteric pain syndrome if you can imagine how much impingement and even friction that that extra piece of calcium causes as this patient tries to walk or lie on there at night now what about mri that's the one that everybody talks about isn't it but it's not usually first line imaging and it does have pros and cons. So it's great to use when the diagnosis is not actually that clear, but it's much more expensive, less accessible, and it's time consuming to both acquire and read. And when you do decide it's time for MRI, what protocol would you pick? That can be tricky, can't it? So I would say, ask yourself, is the primary reason for doing this to MRI for the investigation of greater trochanteric pain syndrome? And if the answer is yes, then a standard MRI scan, i.e. not an orthogram, not some kind of other technique is all that you need. But if it's no, then that's a rabbit hole and it depends on the specific indication. But I say, why don't you just write a good concise history and a couple of differential diagnoses and let the radiologist choose the protocol for you? here's my standard hip MRI protocol. It's captured in three planes and starts off with wide field of view images that includes both hips and the whole pelvis. And that's really important for some of the alternative potential diagnoses that we pick up. And then we move on to a small field of view centered on the hip joint, which you tell us to look at. We use normal and fat saturated sequences. Fat saturated sequences are very water sensitive and they're good for looking at things like bursitis, edema, and joint effusions. And then we also make use of intermediate weighted sequences because they show the cartilage beautifully. Let's take a look at some MR images. As you may not be familiar with looking at MRs, I've labeled these with reference to my anatomical images. This one shows subgluteus minimus bursitis. There's fluid in the bursa and also some sort of dirty intermediate signal, which is synovitis. And that one passes across the anterior facet. That's how we know that it's in minimus. Here is true trochanteric bursitis, which is on the side of the hip and it's between the superficial and deep layers. This one is medius bursitis on its own, more posteriorly and spreading onto the lateral facet. And this one is trochanteric bursitis, but it's seen on a somewhat different study. It's a hip arthrogram. You can tell that because it's got bright signal within the joint, and that's the contrast that we've introduced to get better images of the labrum. In this instance, the labrum and cartilage were completely normal, and the only abnormality was that trochanteric bursitis. I mentioned that post-surgery is one of the situations where we encounter the trochanteric bursitis, and it's certainly where I do um, a number of injections. In this case, you can see that there's this great distortion over the joints, and that's because this patient has resurfaced hips. And that's what the metal does. 
but we can see a clear fluid signal stripe over the greater trochanter, indicating bursitis. You do need to use special sequences to cope with that metal artifact and restrict it so that you can see detail in structures around it nicely. Now, what about ultrasound? We know that it's cheap and it can be used at the point of care. It's also pretty cool because you can do a simultaneous guided intervention in the same consultation if you choose to. But it's very operator skill dependent, especially for the diagnostic part of it. Yes, that's right. It is actually quite easy to guide a needle using ultrasound, but making a diagnosis is much harder and you simply have to make a diagnosis before you can safely proceed to do an injection. And it doesn't really yield pretty archival images that we're all used to looking at like MRI does. So here's a quick look at an ultrasound scan and I've labeled up some of the anatomy for you. We can see that kind of facet anatomy with an anterior and a posterior facet. And I'd argue that there's a little bit of anthesopathy around the peak of the um, crest of the greater trochanter there. We see the gluteus minimus tendon coming off the anterior facet and the gluteus medius tendon more posteriorly. And then that dark stuff deep to it is some fluid within the submedius bursa. Here's another example. It's a transverse high resolution MSK ultrasound, and it shows the anatomy of the lateral and posterior facets. So there's the gluteus medius tendon, and there's a clear elliptical pocket of fluid between the external surface of medius and the overlying iliotibial tract, and that is trochanteric bursitis on its own. But what about a recommended imaging algorithm for you to use? So when you encounter lateral hip pain and you're thinking radiological investigations, I would recommend that you start always with a plain film of the pelvis to get a nice overview and understand the patient's morphology. And of course, to rule out osteoarthritis. Some radiologists get very upset over the term rule out, but it is an important role of of all radiology really. Next thing I typically move on to after the X-ray is an ultrasound of the lateral hip. And I really always like to see an X-ray before I do an ultrasound. And it gives you the option of writing plus slash minus guided injection, which is so convenient for the patient. MR hip is typically received as a specialist request, although I'm not particularly fussy about that as long as the clinical details are good. And with that in mind, why don't we talk about how to request imaging? It may not be that familiar to many of you. And I know that lots of you have taken on FCP roles in recent times and have had to assume this new role. So here's what I think the anatomy of a great request is. First of all, build a good relationship with a friendly MSK radiologist, and then liberally communicate with them and discuss your cases. Between yourselves, you can establish preferences, things like what terminology means or what terminology you like to see on a report, pathways to obtain imaging, and of course, grading systems which you wish to use. And that's particularly important in sport. Write concise but clear referrals and always include a differential diagnosis or a question because that helps me to know your thought processes. And above all, let the radiologist choose the protocol. Don't kind of agonize over it and trying to pick one yourself. Here is an example of what I think would be the perfect request for this setting. So we're asking for an MR of the left hip. And the details we provide are left-sided lateral hip pain radiating to buttock. Started four months ago after an increase in running activities during lockdown. So it tells me which side, and it tells me where the pain radiates to, how long ago it started, and what the suspected cause was. And then we're saying limited response to rest, NSAIDs, and physiotherapy. Had CDH as a child treated with osteotomy, 
So you're telling me what treatment has been tried and failed so far. That helps me know why we've moved on to MR imaging. And it also gives me relevant past history. And then finally, the piece de resistance is to let me know that an X-ray exists at another hospital. And that prevents me needing to re-expose the patient to radiation. Finally, a list of differential diagnosis. And I really don't mind acronyms as long as they are not acronyms, sorry, abbreviations, as long as they are common ones that we all know and use often. Now, is there a role for interventional radiology? So there are lots of things that a radiologist can do around the hip. An ultrasound guidance undoubtedly improves the accuracy of the placement of a needle. Injections can be used in both a diagnostic and a therapeutic setting. And you can see that if you're using them diagnostically, it becomes very important to make sure that the placement is accurate. There's always the debate, isn't there? Steroids versus not steroids. And um, I like to think of it in this quite simplistic way, which is, is there a reversible phase of inflammation present or is it irreversible? Now, if it's irreversible, such as late stage osteoarthritis, then all that we can possibly do is palliate. But if you catch a tendinopathy in an acute phase, and there, is, and there is inflammation, because there isn't always, then we should be able to at least turn off that inflammatory process locally, and it may speed up the patient's recovery. And then there are many other interventions that we can do around the hip beyond the scope here. So this is an example of a simple ultrasound-guided trochanteric bursal injection. It's the case that you saw earlier, and it's the needle being placed into um, the TB in a long plane on the transverse view. If you'd like to read more about the spectrum of interventions possible around the hip, this is a review article by a couple of friends and colleagues down the road in Leeds. And I've put the reference in there for you to take. It's a really good article, which um, includes ultrasound um, amongst other things. So around the hip and the pelvis, there are many structures to target. The anatomy can get quite intricate. And with that, there are quite a number of avoid structures like the sciatic nerve and a number of large blood vessels. The joints that we often target are hip, sacroiliac and symphysis pubis, whilst the common bursi are the greater trochanteric iliopsoas and some others peritendinous injections of the common hamstring and gluteal tendons would be the most frequent. And then I'll just mention lesions because we will come back to that. So it's time to just cover some of the interesting swerve balls which come up in MSK radiology around the pelvis. These are the things that you weren't expecting, which I demonstrate for you on MRI scans, um, x-rays, and occasionally on ultrasound. No, that's not a swerve ball. Well, it often is because so many times that request says greater trochanteric pain syndrome, trochanteric bursitis, etc. And it's just plain old osteoarthritis. And that's why I really do like to have this x-ray done before somebody comes for ultrasound. Ischiofemoral impingement is uncommon. It's a lot less common than um, it appears on request forms. So with the compression of the quadratus femoris in the ischiofemoral space, the muscle becomes edematous. I find that it's nearly always associated with common hamstring tendinopathy, and usually in patients who've got an anatomical predisposition with a narrowed space there between the ischial tuberosity and the lesser trochanter, and they are often runners. We can target the quadratus space with an image guided intervention. We use CT for this because it's a deep structure and it's in a scary place. Slightly less scary, but also using CT guidance is the common hamstring tendon. This poor soul on the left with a coronal stir MRI scan has got bilateral severe common hamstring tendinopathy perhaps even tears in the origins of those tendons, it's so bad. 
Don't forget high iliotibial band sprains. This is one that can definitely catch us out. And you're thinking, where, I think? Well, let me just zoom in and show you. All the way up there at the crest there, coming off inferiorly, we have got the origin of the iliotibial band. And in this case, you can see that there is soft tissue edema around it, indicating that it's inflamed. And I'd also argue that there is deep undersurface internal tear. But what about the torn gluteal tendons as well? Well, there's just tendinopathy or bursitis. Well, a good history will help you with that. A history of a traumatic event or surgery. Loss of function would be, usually be great when there's a tear and counter a poor response to your conservative rehab measures. And of course, I can help you as a radiologist and MRI is what we would use in this situation. Here is a paper which presents a lovely little algorithm for how to diagnose um, tears of the gluteal tendons using MR and how to treat them. And finally, here's a really interesting and unusual case. This is a morel lavalle lesion. The patient presented six weeks after a skiing trip where she had fallen. But the key piece of information was that she took an anticoagulant rivaroxaban. I know it sounds pretty brave, doesn't it, to go skiing when you're on rivaroxaban. Now, she was a really sensible lady and all of the bruising had started to calm down, but she was left with this big lump over there. And first of all, we ultrasounded and found that it was quite squidgy, but contained sort of more solid looking areas. That's quite classical for a hematoma. Scan confirmed this, and the really black walls are typical of something which contains blood products. We can also see that there are lots of septations in the middle of this mass. So working together with the orthopedic team, I said that I thought I could improve matters with interventional radiology. And under ultrasound guidance, I was able to introduce a guide wire into the lesion and to really spin it up inside of there, think of a bit like a food mixer and break up lots of those uh, septations and locules. Once I'd done this, it was altogether more liquid and by compressing it with the ultrasound probe, while simultaneously withdrawing the fluid, we were able to reduce it to about a third of its size. This was then followed by two weeks of serial compression dressings, and the patient was much happier at the end of it. So the key points that I'd like you to remember, a history, an examination, and a knowledge of the predispositions can get you a long way with lateral hip pain. Physiotherapy, strengthening and conditioning are, of course, the first line in approaching this condition. And I've given you a radiological approach if you need to move on from that when they're not working, of starting with an X-ray, moving to an ultrasound, potentially with a guided injection, and MRI when we're really not sure about the diagnosis. Establish a good working relationship with an MSK radiologist and they might be able to help you with both the diagnosis and some carefully chosen image guided interventions. Thank you for your attention and I'd love to take any questions that you've got. Thanks, Dan. Very informative as usual. Thank you. Food mixer, blimey. You like that? <laughs> Well, just the images it conjured up we you yeah gosh i mean I and mean, we're very fortunate in harrogate to have the an expert radiology department literally at the end of the corridor and i think that is for me that's such a key thing i mean i think you must get fed up with us sometimes coming to chat with you but it is so so useful for us to have you there um, now we always like a visit <laughs> <laughs> yeah well we like to come we like to come because we, you know you're so approachable and we can discuss these things and you know I've worked with hips for quite a long time and you know you, it's all, you're always learning aren't you I think that's the thing I think the interesting stuff really is the section I call swerve balls it's where um, you know I, I realize that there are just so many of these that you're treating that I just don't encounter so 
I get a very niche population of lateral hip pain patients. And so I see a disproportionately high number of these weird things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, what kind of percent, what kind of percentage of patients do you get through with um, referrals for lateral hip pain? I mean, just ballpark, what kind of quantity of patients are we looking at? I, well, I, I guess I don't know because I don't know how many there are out there compared to what I get. But um, um, if, if I tell you sort of the volumes I get, I do um, three ultrasound lists a week. And I think uh, on that, I will probably do about eight ultrasounds plus or minus injection for lateral oh. hip. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's an awful lot more kicking out there in primary care, believe me. Yeah. So we've got those are the ones you guys are sorting. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a, qu a question here from Aideen saying, "How common is bone marrow edema?" In the context of lateral hip pain, um, I think we mean. Um, yeah. Then it would be quite uncommon, and it's a, it's an indicator of severity of the tendinopathy process. And in fact, when you've got bone marrow edema. We're beyond just tendinopathy. It's a sign that we've got enthesitis. So, you know, inflammation underlying the foot plate of the tendon. And so I think that those ones will be harder to treat because you haven't only got a soft tissue problem going on. You've got the bone inflammation to calm down as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Just a reminder to all our attendees, please post questions at any point. We might not come to them straight away, but we will have a quick Q&A section um, at the end of, of John's presentation. Thanks very much, Dan. Thank you. So moving on, we've got John Conroy, um, consultant orthopedic surgeon from Harrogate Hospital. All yours, John. Thanks, Stephen. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Right, so I'm talking about the surgical approach to greater trochanteric pain syndrome. I'm going to limit this talk. Um, to the surgical side only. So, uh, you know, you've already had great introductions by um, the other speakers. And I think it's important that, that we note that 90% of patients respond to conservative management. So surgical treatment shouldn't be considered until at least six months of surgical management has been, um, of conservative management has been um, commenced. The remaining group is a difficult group for, for me. Um, and more challenging. In my experience, many of the patients have already been turned down by other surgeons for a surgical procedure. And this is likely to be due to lack of experience in treating the condition, poor evidence for a successful outcome, and preference for surgeons to concentrate on successful surgery, such as hip replacement. I took these three comments from Gareth's earlier presentation that stuck with me. Patients report similar quality of life as patients with end-stage osteoarthritis of the hip. And certainly in my experience, we get patients who come back with trochanteric pain syndrome after a hip replacement who say they were worse than before they had the hip replacement. The pain is intrusive, affecting patients at rest and during activity and is often persistent in nature. And 50% have pain for more than 12 months. So it's a, it's a really significant problem for these patients. So what are our surgical options? These are predominantly open or endoscopic options. Both work very well, but your surgeon will likely have a preference depending on their interpretation of the evidence or their own clinical experience. Simple vasectomy is now less common. ITB release is now more common and combined with a vasectomy in most, most cases. Gluteal tendon repair is growing um, in popularity with increased diagnoses from MRI scans that you'll have ordered from Dan. 
a rise in sporting injuries and improved surgical techniques. So whenever we get imaging and when we get imaging, we get diagnoses and then the surgeons develop treatments for that. Trochanteric reduction osteoto osteotomy is rarely performed. And however, it might be used in really complex resistant cases that have already had surgery previously. So if we talk about trochanteric vasectomy, a standard vasectomy, um, you get good outcomes after two years, looking at the literature, there's low complications, but the studies are limited to very small case studies. Looking in this, in this study of outcomes of arthroscopic vasectomy, there was this nice um, picture in, in this paper. And in this study, they infiltrated the bursa with contrast before surgery. And I thought this was quite good to look at because it really highlights just how extensive um, the bursa is and how the bursa can extend right into the hip joint and towards the hip joint. And this is probably why the recurrence rate is so high after incomplete excision. In this retrospective review of 38 patients, the follow-up was between two and almost seven years. Conservative measures were tried before surgery and it showed visual analog scores improving from 8.4 to 2.6. And the hip outcome score in over 70% showed good overall function. One in five required further procedure, however. In this similar study of 30 patients, only 25 patients were followed up. Pain and function scores improved after surgery with only one in 25 requiring further surgery with an open vasectomy. Again, in this study of uh, early results after endoscopic vasectomy, um, there were no complications or reoperations. Interestingly, all responded to a pre, all, all had previously responded to a pre ultrasound guided anesthetic injection and had only six months of failed conservative treatment. In my practice, I would normally only operate on patients that responded to at least one steroid injection previously and had failed, consult, uh, failed conservative management for approximately a year. This is my preferred operative option um, and approach to radiotrochanteric pain syndrome. I personally believe that a tight ITB is a major causal factor in this condition. My surgical approach is to perform an open release of the ITB. Then we excise any inflamed evident bursa, look for any bones, uh, bone spurs or irregular surface of the greater trochanter and then perform a Z-lengthening -length, Z procedure. Trochanteric impingement on a tight ITB in the squatting, sitting, and walking upstairs can exacerbate the pain in this area. A release of a tight ITB can help these symptoms. ITB lengthening generally has good results. Um, I personally uh, believe an open direct lengthening with a repair would be expected to have a better result than um, an arthroscopic procedure in my experience. Most surgeons will release the ITB uh, proximally rather than distally, but I only, I do perform distal releases, but they're only in patients where I don't achieve, I don't think I've achieved a good enough result from a proximal release and lengthening in the first instance. So generally I would do a proximal uh, lengthening. There are several techniques described to release the ITB, but my preference is the Z lengthening with an open approach or a cruciate release in an arthroscopic procedure, which I'll show you in one of the slides. Most surgeons at the same time as the ITB lengthening will perform a vasectomy as a standard. It's a relatively low, low risk procedure. And uh, looking at the, in this study, we look at the less common distal ITB lengthening uh, first. Uh, in this study, there was 11 patients. A Z lengthening was used. 
And this picture shows the type of said lengthening um, that those surgeons have performed. It shows uh, that the, their technique, we only repair, they only repaired the central portion after lengthening. And I would generally repair the length of the Z lengthening um, in an angulated Z shape. So I'd be able to reassure myself that the repair would be strong enough across the whole of the Z lengthening um, for the patient to fully weight bear after surgery. In my patients, I would normally recommend that they can um, mobilize with crutches, fully weight bearing for the first six weeks. Uh, in this study, it was a day case procedure with one to seven years follow up, and they showed a uh, good improvement in pain and function with no major complications. In this study um, by Craig, they showed a, a well, they performed an open proximal Z lengthening procedure in 17, in 17 hips or 15 patients with a mean follow up of four years. They described 16 good results and one poor result with eight excellent results with overall improved Harris hip scores. In this study was another open approach to Z lengthening with 16 patients, Z lengthening with additional bisectomy and all patients were happy with the surgery with 13 out of 14 happy to have the surgery again. Another study with endoscopic bisectomy and ITB release um, showed that patients, uh, well, they had five patients, so it was only a small study. Uh, pain, pain scores improved with all the patients satisfied. The small incision and short operating time can be very appealing to the patients, and often patients will choose this approach if they're given the option of an open or endoscopic. But in my experience, the view at the time of surgery is often of my patients have needed further surgery. So I'm, I'm quite skeptical about proceeding with endoscopic surgery. And I only tend to do it if patients specifically request it. In this video, um, it will give you an idea of um, surgery. And in this patient, you, you get a really good view of uh, the bursa. On the top surface, um, you have the trochanter, and you have, oh, sorry, you have the ITB at the top, and then you've got the um, bursa in the middle, and you've got the trochanter. So top of the screen is ITB. The surgeon here is using an arthroscopic wand to excise the bursa tissue. And in, in this area, this is the ITB and they're using an arthroscopic wand to perform a cruciate incision to release the tension of the ITB. The surgeon here is placing the leg into an abducted position to allow a little bit more space in that gap, which can often be very tight, and to allow the uh, release in that area. This can be quite to do on the bleeding, the space is very tight, and you don't really get a full sensation of how much laxity there is or how much you can bear, unless you can um, test it easily with the pressure, you can really get the idea of how much you release. We do tell um, more than we identify you to the answer of whether they're managing the patient's pressure. That's one of the goals of GTS, that's all important. If these tears are missed, Patients can fail surgical management, um, and this can be a real problem as you have to go back and deal with them at a later date. So it's always worth getting the appropriate imaging before if we if we suspect these type of injuries or if there's anything that's a little bit unusual. Tests can be partial or intersubstance. As well as pain in the region, patients can present with weakness of abduction or a positive Trendelenburg test. And these are often the younger, fitter patients that present with this condition. 
or surgery. The of medius is the most commonly torn. The surgical repair of isolated gluteal tendon repairs have shown good long-term results in the literature. This slide shows a summary of the literature. It shows good long-term results in both open and arthroscopic repairs. Retards are the most significant complication and can be up to 25%. So that's a, that's a significant portion of, of our patients. Trochanteric reduction osteotomy attempts to uh, correct the biomechanics around the hip. This study shows uh, good results in this difficult group of patients. The authors conclude the procedure is safe and effective, but the numbers are really small. And uh, I believe that this could have been replicated with less significant surgery in several of these cases. Most of us will have seen trochanteric pain after total hip replacement, and there's no doubt ab abnormal biomechanics can lead to these symptoms. In most cases, Soft tissues will accommodate over a six months to a year period, but the patients can be really miserable if the hip's been put in in a tight position. They often complain of worse pain than the arthritis that led to the surgery. It generally happens when the uh, offset has been increased or the leg length has been increased. Um, and this is, this is really easily done by the surgeon because they, they want to create tightness in this area to prevent hip dislocation. So we have a spectrum with hip dislocation at one end of the spectrum and um, uh, we have a hip dislocation and we also um, have the sort of ideal leg length and offset for function. So if we, if we make the hip too tight, we get pain. And if we make it too lax, we get dislocation. This study um, looks at the post-operative distances in um, leg length and offset by analyzing 90 patients after a total hip replacement with 3D CT scanning. And it's an interesting study because it shows the outcomes three years after hip replacement looking for greater trochanteric pain syndrome. Patients with greater trochanteric pain syndrome after hip replacement showed a significant higher discrepancy of combined leg length, femoral and acetabular offset compared with the non-operative side. In the specific group where the deviation was more than five millimeters, patients complained about trochanteric symptoms in almost 30% compared with only 8% in those with biomechanical restoration of less than five millimeters. So it makes common sense that putting the hip in tight or with a long leg length may cause trochanteric pain syndrome, um, but it's nice to see um, the results from, um, from this study. And also it's only a matter of a few millimeters that makes the difference. So accuracy is so important. They concluded that, the, that an exact restoration of leg length, acetabular and femoral offset significantly reduces post-operative trochanteric pain syndrome and, in, and improves clinical outcomes. But despite this, four to 17% of patients after a hip replacement have trochanteric pain syndrome. In order to get the best possible biomechanical balance to the hip, I personally use the uh, MAKO robotic assisted surgery system. And um, this has 3D preoperative planning and robotic placement. So we can balance the hip before and during the actual surgery. The accurate placement of the implants and real leg length um, feedback that we get from the system has made great improvements, I feel, in um, um, trochanteric pain syndrome, although it does not completely um, resolve the, the issue. This plan on the, um, on, on this image, you can see the plan on the right hand side shows the exact size of the implants that we've selected to fit for this patient, and it gets the right bi biomechanical balance. The main screen on the um, left shows the expected post op appearance before we've even performed the operation. And the four boxes at the bottom comes up during the time of the surgery and shows the hip length combined offset versus the preoperative hip and the, and the um, 
and the opposite hip. So we can work out exactly how to balance the leg length and the offset from our um, pre and post operative um, hip planning. So in conclusion, conservative treatment is the gold standard for GTPS, as we know, with over a 90% success rate. And this is where we should really concentrate our management. The diagnosis is clinical, but examination should, should exclude other differential diagnoses, be it from the uh, lumbar spine, for instance. It's important to realize that when surgeons are operating on this condition, there's no level one or two studies for the surgical procedures. So we, a lot of the evidence we're using is on simple case-based um, series. So the evidence is quite poor. I think one of the biggest factors is as a hip replacement surgeon is to make sure that we balance the hip replacement correctly to avoid GTPS uh, post hip replacement surgery. I put my website up here. So if you do need any more information or need to contact me, my details are on the website. And if you click, click on the, the email, it goes directly to me. Uh, I also wanted to quickly tell you about some of the new technologies in hip arthroscopy. And um, this is um, some of the information we can gain before hip arthroscopy with a preoperative uh, hip map analysis looking and visualizing exactly where the uh, cam or pincer lesion might be prior to surgery. And then we have the uh, facility now that during surgery, we're able to take uh, imaging from the image intensifier. Um, here we can see the bone impingement pre and post resection of a cam lesion in theater. Uh, the yellow pictures on the left indicate an abnormal cam. And then the green pictures on the right show uh, where we have um, resected that cam. The results can be printed out for the patients and uh, patients can share with a physio. Here, um, another interesting thing we have is a postless traction table. Uh, I believe we're the only uh, hospital in the country that has that at the present time. And that reduces risk of uh, perineal pain or nerve injury if patients are on traction. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, John. Um, I've got a question. Are you, are you finding you, that you, with your robot, that you are getting less complications then? And, and by what, what degree are you finding that? Do you, are you finding it's a lot more reliable and you're not getting complications afterwards? Could you say that again? Because I didn't hear that. Sorry, did you not hear it? So, yeah. with regards to the robot, are you finding that you're yeah. getting less, less post-surgical complications, such as GTPS afterwards? Yeah, definitely. I think the, the, most, um, the thing that we pick up the most is that patients are up on their feet and walking quicker. And I don't think um, people are coming off the crutches maybe one to two weeks after in patients that, you know, repeatedly where I wouldn't have seen that before. And I think it's the, the matter of just getting the balance correct. Now, I wouldn't say that we don't get GTPS in these patients because we do get it. And we, we know that it's more complex than, than we think. And, but I think it just, it, it just makes us more consistent on getting the balance right. Okay, thank you. So I think this is a question for the for the four of us, actually. So one of my FCP colleagues is, is saying that since he's been spending more time in general practice, he's finding there's a significant number of patients out there who are attending for their routine three to four steroid, blind steroid injections into their lateral hip, often without any other intervention. What are our panel's thoughts on that happening? And how should that be affecting our practice in, uh, in general practice? Gareth, would you like to give us your you take on that? Um, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it's not an uncommon story. We do um, uh, see and hear it quite a lot, um, uh, particularly patients that we manage quite a lot in primary care. Um, um, from you know, uh, GPs doing a lot of um, routine injections on these patients. Um, my... What would your gold standard practice be, Gareth? As someone who's kind of immersed in the GTPS world and eats <laughs> and breathes it all day, every day. Absolutely. 
what what would your gold standard kind of what would you do conservatively in primary care before you went and passed them on to Dan or John? Yeah, well, I think Dan's slightly the nail on the head in terms of the way these patients should be managed. So they, I would say the the bog standard things would be as a you know in in, in the, the slides I presented would be first of all activity modification, um, trying to educate patients about um, positions that are likely to aggravate the condition. And then starting them on a, on a graded loaded program, my, my thing would be that, that we would try to monitor them over a period of something in the region of 12 to 16 weeks. I think sometimes we would go on longer, uh, particularly some of our more complex NHS patients, providing we would see an improvement. Um, but I think if we're seeing no improvement in 12 to 16 weeks, then my next thing would be to then send them for investigation. Um, but yeah, that if they're not, given the education about first of all what the condition is um and then about um activity modification and why they need to do it and then a a, a graded program and that, that loads them sufficiently that you know, works them hard and um, if they're not getting that as the first line treatment then i always have my doubts about everything else because um what data we have just doesn't support it and we also know that there's potential long-term consequences of um you know of doing not, um, repeated steroid injections in the same place over a number of over a number of years. I guess the problem is, though, is, as I as a FCP myself, most patients want that instant gratification, don't they? They want that quick fix, fix me, doctor, and trying to get a buy in for a twelve to sixteen week rehab program is difficult, isn't it? Yeah, I think that they they do. I think it's about. Um, but again, it's, you know, it's, we're still talking about patient-centred care. Um, and I think the most important thing is that we uh, explain the risks and benefits to, to people early on um, at the first contact about the, the, the risks and benefits of the two interventions. Um, and and, and you know, it's still patient choice at the end of the day. The other thing that plays into it where I work is physio waiting lists. So some of the, the, the consultants I work with will say, um, you know, I don't really want to inject this patient, but I know your waiting list is about 18 weeks. And so I feel like I've got to do something while they're, while they're waiting. So there's other factors that can influence it. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important. They get that, they, they get good quality education as early as possible. How quickly would you like to see them, Dan? I, I think I'm going to be sending more patients your way following on from your uh, presentation, certainly for, for x-ray. It's not something that I routinely do mm. if, if I think in my clinical impression that it is a gluteal tendinopathy. I don't routinely send them for an x-ray to exclude OA. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you have to with every patient, but um, when they're not progressing, it's certainly the first thing that I would do because there's just a, an enormous crossover with osteoarthritis, even though we're probably sitting here thinking, come on, we don't confuse those two. But you just got to remember that OA just presents in so many diverse ways for different people, especially around the, the hip. And then if you bring in confounding factors, like they do also have tendinopathy because of the gait modification, and they might have knee OA, back pain, all these things. So it, it's not always that clean cut. And, um, but I think I made that comment more that I, I guess I get upset at how many make it to me for ultrasound and injection. And when I go looking, there's no x-ray because mm. I mean, a big principle for me with intervention is that you should know what you're approaching and, uh, you know, a hip x-ray, a pelvic x-ray just gives you that overview of what am I approaching? Whereas you've seen the images from an ultrasound. They don't give you any clues as to the, what is going on around the hip, around the pelvis. They literally just show you the specific tendon that you're looking at, its attachment, the bursa. And I don't think that, uh, I don't think that certainly a lot of GPs recognize that, that it's such a targeted kind of zoomed in modality. Okay. I'd, I, would, I would certainly agree with Dan over that. I, if, I would insist that every one of my patients gets an x-ray. So many patients with hip arthritis will present with lateral hip pain as, and, it, and it's hip arthritis. And when you, when you do the hip replacement, they get better. Or when you do an injection in the hip, they get better. So I think patients really find it difficult to describe where their pain is coming from. And the other thing about the x-ray is 
we quite often will see a um, a small like osteophyte or growth of bone over the lateral aspect, and they're the ones that really do well with surgery. Yeah. What the the take home message for me for um, people um, watching this would be try and persuade the patients not to have surgery because the surgery the, you know there's i i've got to talk about surgery and how it can help but realistically the results of surgery are poor and it's the patients have got to realize that they have surgery um it might not work there's a significant chance it won't work and then subsequently they have scar tissue if they have ongoing problems then they blame the surgery and they say, well, can we redo it again, redo it again? And if patients are taught to accept that they should stop certain activities like um, lifting, carrying, excessive exercise, or, um, or they, they learn that they, this condition is something they've got to live with, got to it's a chronic thing, I think that's a lot safer for a lot of the patients than, than having surgery. And you, I think you mentioned it before, everyone wants a quick fix and they think, oh, having an operation will fix it. But this isn't a condition where that, that works, really. Yeah, and, you know, pulling out that comment that um, I've seen in the question and answers from uh, Steve Foster about um, multiple injections, it's, it's really something that I encounter that I think is deeply rooted in primary care referral. And um, I try and break that cycle when I see them yeah. and um, you know, there's, there's, there's a diagnostic use here, which is often the context I'm getting it in from John. Um, and then there is carefully considered therapeutic use when we know that the patient has tried physio strength condition activity modification. Um, but I can never be reassured that they've gone through that cycle um, when it comes from primary care, unless of course it's specified on the on the referral. Yeah, I mean, I think that just highlights why we need those. We 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 have those closer links, don't we? Really, which and I think we're very fortunate in Harrogate to have those. Yeah. But in in bigger centres, they're probably not going to have that. Um, yeah, the FCP program has been so far an incredibly positive thing in my experience, and I'm very glad to be involved in advising and doing educational events because it allows us to have debates like this and move towards evidence-based practice and i just simply have no way of reaching general practitioners i mean yeah. i've tried to put events on before and the attendance is very limited and i think we have to remember that they have such a large gamut to cover and um and we just do msk so we can we can really focus in on it Okay, thank you. Um, so we got another question about uh, glute med repairs, John. Can you see that on the question and answer section? So it says failed to heal rate of 25% in glute med repairs is good compared to 42% in rotator cuff tears. Do you see that glute med repairs are becoming more commonplace or hip surgeons more pragmatic and ahead of the curve compared to shoulder colleagues? There you go, um, I think... Have a glute medius repair. We not many people will do will do them. So um, it's a it's nowhere near as common as repairs in in, in the shoulder. Um, I think that the fixation in the bone around the hip is is quite good. We get really good fixation there. And so I think that's probably why it's it's perhaps a bit more successful. And also we we wouldn't do as many um, repairs in older patients. So certainly we do hip fractures. We see quite a lot of um, uh, tendons around the hip that have pulled off. And I suspect that perhaps um, as you get older, uh, the concentration of, of um, tears around the gluteal muscles is quite significant, but perhaps um, because of the glute max and the other muscles in that area, it's perhaps not as symptomatic as um, perhaps they are around the shoulder. So those specific patients that I'd be treating with gluteus medius repairs are the young active patients who've probably got an isolated injury. And it might happen, you know, once every three to six months, something like that. So it's really uncommon. Yeah. So very low volume of patients then. Yeah. 
John, did you see that um, that device, I, that new device I shared with you? Um, yeah, yeah, a couple of good. days ago. It's interesting. I, I've posted the link in the chat there. It's a a tweet from uh, Bill Morrison, who's a, a radiologist I know out in the US, and um, he's a really interesting guy. He he invents a lot of medical devices, and this is a sort of compression screw. Um, how do I describe it? Like a spring-loaded compression screw that he's created to to pin down torn tendons. And I had a bit of a debate with him, which you can you can follow from that tweet. But the limitation is it's if you're doing this percutaneously, of course, you don't have any way to put the tendon back where it's meant to be to reduce it. And that, that's where John has the the advantage. So this is really just for uh, unretracted ones. Gareth, do the surgeons that you work with at the Royal Orthopaedic do similar surgery to John? Uh, yes, yeah, they do. And um, it was quite nice to hear John echoing exactly the same messages that they, they say to patients. They say, you know, I really, the message I get from them is we really don't want to see these patients. We only want to see these patients as an absolute last resort, the disabled ones, because yeah. um, they're complex. And by the time they get to John, often been through multiple NHS services, had multiple treatments and, um, you know, have a lot of poor prognostic indicators. So they only want to see them at the last resort, but they do do um, no I mean, similar surgeries at, um, at our place um, for those ones who they feel they can help. Excellent. Good. Have we got any more questions from our attendees? There's nothing there. We, Martin asked, how common is a pudendal nerve injury in hip arthroscopy? Do you come across um, many of them, John? Uh, no. Um you i have seen them but they're they're really quite uncommon um and you you get them you get them with the tr with traction it like so i've seen um, i've probably seen about three or four um most of them are short-lived but you you know the your worry is whether they're long-standing and um and they can quite massive. if you speak to uh, there's some studies which say that what the surgeons pick up from pudendal nerves um, is really minor because patients don't normally tell the surgeons that they've had it. But actually, if you send um, questionnaires out to the patients, then a lot more patients will um, respond that they've had pudendal nerve problems. So I think the surgeons are probably a bit blase to it. Maybe as <laughs> physios, you you get that more common commonly. So it'd be quite a good study to look at whether the traction related um, injury that causes this, if we don't have a, a post post with the traction, we should see less of it, I guess. You need that for your surgical technique though, don't you? I mean, just to try and get the distraction on the, on the hip joint itself. No, that's, that's the point of the table I showed. It's um, what we do is we put uh, the table in a head down position. It's got friction on the surface and we can get traction without the post. Ah, right. Apologies. Yeah, so, it, it, Apologies. so it's uh, it, it, when you, it's, it's good. 80 pounds though for the end of the table. <laughs> not cheap. Stephen, I see there's a couple more questions um, come through about injections, actually. Ah, right. Hang on a minute. Have I missed those? PRP therapy for gluteal tendinopathy. Hmm. Any thoughts from any of our panel on PRP therapy? works for everything doesn't it <laughs> um, uh, i can say that i've never used it um I, well i've used it for other stuff mostly in patients who want to avoid steroids for some reason or need to for example they're banned from using steroids um but um no not for this condition gareth do you know anything um yeah there's certainly no data to support it and there's not a lot of interest in taking it up there's not really any uh, research groups i know that are looking at it the australians a bit like the shockwave have completely dismissed it um and, and not not interested in it um and yeah there's, there's no there's no convincing data that it's something that needs to be taken forward not in not in lateral hip pain at the moment i just wonder whether i mean we've had constant conversations recently about because of what covid's done with regards primary care and waiting lists in secondary care it's could there be a growth market in all of these things like shockwave therapy, injections, PRP? Because we are going to have to manage patients a lot longer whilst they wait to have their orthopedic and radiology interventions. I can certainly see there's going to be... Abby, open... um, 
a growth in demand. Yeah, I mean, we certainly uh, PRP injections for joints is increasing. And if you talk to surgeons in the US for hip arthroscopy, and they would prefer to give PRP injections than steroids. So I think there's definitely a move from um, steroid to PRP. And patients feel um, a lot better about having their own um, blood products injected into them rather than uh, steroid. So I think we, we are heading that way. It's quite expensive, though, compared to steroid to, to give it. So we, I think, as Gareth's been saying, it's important that we get, and, and Dan, it's important that we get some evidence before we embark on that. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's a bit of evidence in the knee, isn't there? There was um, a fairly decent study, um, and uh, I think two or three further ones to to back up decent um, palliation of uh, mild and moderate knee osteoarthritis. But we haven't yet seen that information for the hip, although it's definitely something that John and I have been talking about because of this population that we meet who don't like the idea of steroids and who we're trying to bridge towards hip surgery um, who've just got mild or moderate OA and they're really too young to be going into hip surgery right now. Do you find that quite in increasingly common then that patients are averse, adverse to steroid treatment? I think there are a lot more questions about it and actually the questions went crazy with COVID because you know, everything was a, was a question mark with, with that disease. Um, and I know I was involved with the British Society of Skeletal Radiologists in the initial position statements of saying, we need to be careful with steroids and this very, very inflammatory condition. Um, but, you know, with time, it turns out that they were the one thing that dampened your response and they were absolutely yeah. fine. Excellent. But um, it's... Um, it's all about gathering, gathering evidence, really. Um, and, and having it, it, it's not just evidence that we know the right thing, but it arms us to give patients these answers before we just do it. Mm, absolutely. We're always learning, We're always learning. Um, I, think, I think that's it. Um, we've got no more questions there. Is there any, anything else that you panelists would like to take home message i think we've all put on our all on your slides you've got some really good take home messages there for patients to go away for our attendees to go away with anything else that uh, if, if any of the attendees would like to ask any more questions or want to give us any follow-up um i did put the twitter handles on there um if anybody would like to contact me directly i think i put my um email address up on there which i can put up at the end as well when we've all kind of signed off um so I think um, I think we'll draw draw the night to a close there, everybody. So thanks I just like to say fa thanks to the, all the panelists. Thanks, Gareth, Dan, and John. Um, it's been great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I am looking to organise future webinars for Harrogate Harlow. I think I've got a date coming up at the end of April, um, where one of our orthopaedic surgeons, Mark Farndon, might be talking about um, foot and ankle surgery. Um, so if you keep your eyes peeled for that in any which way you have um, booked on through this one, I'll, um, I'll send you an email and keep you updated via our Twitter. Um, just seeing if there's another question just come through. Oh, there was a question here from Stuart. Final question um, about total hip replacement and injections. Um... Is that the anonymous one from earlier, maybe? Um, just maybe he's he's come back in as his name. Uh, uh, um, Intraarticular hip joint injections are contraindicated in total hip, but can you get away with a blind stroke guided lateral hip injection for DT GTPS after total hip replacement? Uh, so absolutely, yes. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Yeah. So happy to have a lateral blind lateral hip joint injection, even if the patient's had a total hip replacement. I, I would be. I mean, I do that fairly regularly. So, yeah. I mean, if you're doing it in, you know, if you have any doubt, then, I mean, it, it would be, I think most of the surgeons would like to know about it, you know, depending how long ago okay. they had it. So, yeah. so it, it's worth having a chat with the surgeon, but I, personally, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be averse to someone doing that. So if I'm seeing a patient of yours 
who potentially might have developed lateral hip pain post total hip and I was thinking about injecting it out of courtesy you'd like to know about it yeah I think I think that would be sensible for yeah. um for it, just to listen to some of the surgeons um but you know ideally it could having having an injection can make a huge difference to the patient and they think that there's a failure with it so in most patients even if you try to convince them that it's trochanteric pain syndrome, they still think it's the hip that's the problem. Yeah, so they, the they normally need a full review. Um, but I personally, I wouldn't mind you doing that injection because you'll just make them better. <laughs> what would I say? I'd say it should always be guided, wouldn't I, though? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you well, know, that's... maybe we're getting to a place where that's going to be the norm because these tiny ultrasound machines that you can get now, I mean... A lot of them are not good enough for diagnostic imaging, but for guiding a needle, they are. For therapeutic. And, you know, it's just it's just common sense, isn't it, that it's safer and more accurate when you can see what you're doing. Well, I think as a physio profession, there seems to be an awful lot more interest in potentially doing the ultrasound from a diagnostic point of view. And I know that's an initiative that you started relatively recently with one of our colleagues at Harrogate, Dan, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's right. And I've been involved quite a lot in both physiotherapist and sports and exercise medicine, ultrasound education. And um, it's um, the thing about it is there's definitely some radiologists who don't want to get involved, um, but really it leads to, it leads to it being a kind of underground movement, doesn't it? So surely better to get involved, give some decent education, and hopefully at the same time, show your vast knowledge on it and what you kind of can safely do and should stay away from and send to the radiologist. I think it's just having that continuous ongoing dialogue, isn't it? And having conversations about patient presentations and outcomes. Right, I think that's all the questions wrapped up. Um, thanks again, everybody, much appreciated. Um, so we'll, um, we'll call it a day there. Thank you very much indeed. Good evening.